So our first presenter is Lucy Ledler. She's a lecturer <coughs> in English at Rollins College. Her talk is called Beyond the Flip, Lending Learning in the Literature Classroom. She describes using Instagram selfies in an American literature course to promote active learning. Lucy. OK, hello. Thank you for coming. Um, I have a, I think the reason that I am going first is because I am the official low-tech person at the high-tech person conference, because I have handouts. <laughs> <laughs> but this uh, presentation outlines um, an assignment that I developed for an American literature course at Rollins. And um, the course is called American Dreams, American Nightmares. And it's part of our general education curriculum. So the population is second semester freshmen, which are so fun and so challenging <laughs> to work with. But anyways, I'm going to kind of back up a little bit and talk about how I came to the project before I actually get into the project itself. And the project itself is what your handout is actually about, OK? So um, as I said, I teach writing in American literature courses at Rollins College, a small liberal arts <coughs> college in Winter Park, Florida. My office is located in Orlando Hall, one of the English department's two main buildings. Each classroom in this building is home not to individual student desks and a lecturer's podium, uh, but to a huge oblong wooden table, they're gorgeous, that seats about 18 people. From my office, I often listen to tour guides, usually upperclassmen and women, as they regale groups of prospective students and their parents with stories from their own experiences sitting around these very tables with their peers and their professors. They talk about falling in love with a novel, discovering their major, or getting to know a faculty mentor through class meetings that feel more like conversations among friends and colleagues. Uh, they talk about, uh, excuse me, this table provides a striking visual for these newcomers of what life at Rollins could be like active learning, intellectual engagement and discovery, and of course, community. For me, these tables have come to represent the flipped classroom, a constant buzzword in the often unstable world of blended learning research. Before discussing the flipped classroom, or more specifically getting beyond the flip, which is the goal of this presentation today, uh, let me zoom out a little bit and talk about um, spending a little bit of time in the world of blended learning research. Um, what I'm learning is that no one really knows what this means. Uh, most sources report the use of technology to enhance the classroom space or experience, but exactly how this should be done most effectively is unclear. And most published research on the topic is about courses or programs developed for large public universities like UCF, my neighbor in Orlando, or pedagogical practices developed in non-humanities departments like computer science or mathematics. In my search for answers more applicable to my own aims as an English teacher at a small private liberal arts school, I decided to reach out directly to colleagues at colleges comparable to my own. I emailed English department faculty at institutions such as Bryn Mawr, uh, Colby, Kenyon, Hendricks, Davidson, just to name a few. When comparing the responses I received, I found once again that blended learning does not have a stable definition. It seems that most respondents articulated a definition that fit their individual departments or their own college's unique needs, while some respondents noted their college is wrestling with the same issues surrounding blended learning as we are at Rollins such as faculty members' anxieties about change, um, funding issues, and IT support. Uh, others weren't even really sure what blended learning meant. I should note that a few respondents seem to characterize online learning somewhat negatively, and that's sort of polite. <laughs> One noted that online credit does not transfer at their institution. Um, another noted that blended learning was, quote, unattractive. I'm not going to out anybody but specifically, but those were quotes. Um, no one responded that blended learning has specific policies on their campus or in their curriculum. Several people responded that individual, individual faculty members do what they deem appropriate for their individual classes. In other words, if faculty want to use technology in a class, they do it. Um, I found this variety of institutional involvement notable in this quest for a definition of blended learning because at Rollins, faculty must take a workshop they must seek course approval, 
and they must reduce seat time by 25 to 49% for a course to receive a blended learning designation. Um, you can see probably where some of our anxieties are coming from when I can tell you that. Um, I should note here that the very tech-heavy assignment that I'm getting ready to talk about, and I promise I am getting there, um, did not receive a, um, a blended learning designation. It's not considered blended by relevant standards. <clears throat> so what is blended learning? I'm still not sure, but out of what can seem like a pretty vague or disparate conversation, the one term that does rise to the surface again and again is the flipped classroom. And unlike larger, more, the larger, more nebulous concept of blended learning, the flipped classroom generally seems to, seem, seems to mean the same thing no matter who you ask. In a flipped class, which I'm sure all of you know this, course materials, lectures, readings are posted online, and theories, key concepts, or definitions from these materials are to be absorbed by students asynchronously in advance of the course meeting. Then the students and teacher come together to discuss, apply, and question uh, what they've learned. In other words, in the flipped classroom, face-to-face -face time is reserved not for traditional lecture, but for inquiry-based active or student-centered learning. So for example, in a math class, students might watch the explanation of the concept in a six to seven minute lecture posted on the web, and then in class, they'd work on example problems with a professor or in peer groups. So as a teacher in the humanities, I immediately recognize the flipped classroom because it's something that I already do. It's something that my institution supports, something that my students expect, again, as symbolized by those gorgeous, huge wooden tables where we all sit and discuss these ideas. In fact, um, I began to venture further into the realm of blended learning research for this project. I caught myself a time or two thinking of those campus tours, of those wooden tables, and feeling a little bit proud of my already flipped courses. Maybe even a little smug. <laughs> and there's the red flag, right? Um, it's time to interrupt that dangerous self-congratulatory moment and actually break into that romantic postcard-like vision of the liberal arts college experience and honestly examine what my already flipped classroom actually looks like. And that's when I uncover some troubling truths. Yes, my students come to class having read material on their own. They come to class ready to participate, not merely to listen to my lecture. I never lecture. <laughs> But isn't the pedagogical power of a flipped classroom about something deeper than these kind of logistics or scheduling? A flipped classroom's true potential lies in its ability to democratize the educational experience, empowering students to think critically for themselves, not just, just to digest what an authority figure provides in the form of assignments, questions, text, etc. If I'm honest with myself, my already flipped classroom isn't all that democratic. In fact, when I really think about it, I wonder if I'm really trying to let student ideas take the reins over my own carefully planned agenda. On a day-to-day -day level, I pose the questions that direct our discussion of the novel, a discussion that too often looks like a tennis match as the students physically turn their heads from side to side from me to the student who answers my question, back to me again for my reaction, and the next question. Throughout the course of the semester, I write the quizzes, the discussion board threads, and the essay prompts that send clear messages to students about what's valuable, what should be learned, what should be taken from the course. In fact, before our course even begins, I write the description for the course catalog, the syllabus, I select the books we'll read, I even craft a title for the course that sends clear prepackaged messages about the learning outcomes that a student who satisfactorily fulfills the stated course requirements can reasonably expect to achieve. So my class is flipped in that I don't lecture. But is it really flipped in the sense that my students have the opportunity to examine, critique, and even define our course subject matter? Do I encourage them to decide for themselves what constitutes knowledge, what we deem valuable as a class, as a culture? Today I want to share an exp uh, experiment excuse me, in blended learning that I think addresses this issue. It's an assignment called Selfie and Community that I originally developed in order to help students connect the literature that we read in a freshman level general education course to their own lives. But through practice and reflection, I'm excited to say that I think it does a little something more. 
Specifically, this assignment uses Instagram to help students think critically and connectively about literature, but it also goes beyond the flip to chip away at the traditional professor-student power structure of a humanities classroom. And this is where I would ask you to look at the handout that I provided. This handout has, I think, four or five sections, the first of which is the assignment description from the syllabus. Um, I'm not going to read to you what it says, as if this were the first day of our class. But um, I just want to look at the first paragraph and then talk a little bit about what the assignment asks students to do. So um, one of the goals of the IMW neighborhood, and again, this is part of our general education structure, is to examine how identity is informed by the often complex relationship between the self, or perhaps more accurately, selves and communities. For example, how do we construct, assert, perform selfhood, and how do the communities of which we are a part influence that process? Furthermore, our class seeks to understand how the literature we read is not just a static collection of words bound to a page, but a living, breathing entity that speaks to our own lives in meaningful ways. In order to achieve these goals, each week you will take and post a selfie that in some way illustrates the following, your relationship to a particular community, and the American dream or nightmare as represented in our class readings and discussion. So what follows is in the assignment description is the logistics of how they will do this, what time it's due, what kind of account they need. I required them to have um, a professional Instagram account because um, I didn't want to see their personal one. <laughs> um, so those details are outlined here about how the assignment will happen throughout the course of the semester. Uh, the second portion of, oh, excuse me. So, oh yeah, the second portion of the, assign, uh, the handout talks about the essay assignment. So every week throughout the semester, they were posting um, a selfie with a short caption that explained why they created it, why they posted it, how it related to what we were doing in class. Um, twice throughout the semester, once around midterm and then once around finals, um, they chose one uh, selfie from their growing collection and they wrote a really brief essay about that. So they expanded essentially on that idea in essay form and we took a class meeting and they presented their essays to the class, all right? So then what follows of the third section of your handout, which starts on page two, is uh, some examples for you guys to see from their Instagram accounts. And um, some of the explanations uh, in the boxes on the side of the examples come from the essays that they developed. I think the first three images have excerpts from essays. Uh, the, the final examples just have the caption enlarged because they didn't choose to write about the particular image and I thought it was cool. And um, the, the captions themselves are a bit too small to read on the image that I gave you. So you can see the kind of work that the students are doing. And as you peruse these examples, I'd like for you to note how the students are taking the task of defining the American dream into their own hands. Every single one of them says like week one or week five or week whatever, and then they have a word um, that they chose, that they thought was important in the reading, in their lives, in their definition of the American dream. And those words came back to our class meetings, and they started to guide the conversation. They were defining the dream, not me. Um, so they're determining what themes are relevant in the books we're reading based on their own life experiences and hopes for their futures. Uh, when we brought these images back into the classroom space, they directed our collective questioning of these texts, what we see in them, why we read them, what they reveal about our individual and cultural values. These images created by the students themselves became a kind of course textbook that helped us access and talk about the novels from our reading list in truly productive and democratic ways. They helped us flip not just how we used class time, but the class time power dynamic, the classroom power dynamic, I, I think. Um, I learned from these students what the American dream means in these texts in their lives, not the other way around. Um, and I, in your own time, I don't know how much time I have left, so please feel free to look through these examples and what the students are writing about them, which I, I know it's my baby, but I think it's pretty impressive. I think you might like it too. Um, the next section of the, uh, the handout, which starts on, on page six, is student feedback. At the end of the class in the last week or so, I gave students very highly technical. It was just a little survey, anonymous, that I passed out at the end of the class and asked them some questions. Uh, which are included in bold face, this, the questions that I asked, and some of their responses. Um, I didn't include all of the responses because 
that would just take up a lot of time. And they were saying a lot of the same things. So these are representative of the kind of the main trends of what they were talking about. And I highlighted the parts that I think were even more interesting. There is one in here that's really funny that talks about um, how this assignment helped the student connect to literature that was far too old to understand. <laughs> this is 20th century American lit. I just had to, <laughs> I had to point that out even though it's not that relevant to what we're doing right now. <laughs> so there are three major trends when looking at student feedback. Uh, the first is that students noted that this assignment forced them to think critically about course text in conjunction with their own lives. But perhaps more interestingly, students took ownership of the process. Um, participation, creation, articulation became, quote, fun, as they say again and again in their responses. Uh, the second major trend was about Instagram itself. Instagram served as a useful medium for this assignment. Students note the ease of use, the familiarity of the medium, and I think most interestingly, um, they noted that Instagram allowed them to write more than other mediums like Twitter would have. How often do your students ask to write more? <laughs> Um, and the final trend was that students also noted that the assignment helped with community building. They liked seeing what others were posting and talking about. Um, several noted the emotional connection it gave them with their peers. Um, we know, particularly since this is from a, a general education curriculum, which we just launched at Rollins, which is hoping to improve the freshman sophomore experience, we know that's when students get kind of disenchanted, where they drop out, where they transfer. <coughs> it's a big risk area, so I thought that this note about community building was important, that it piggybacked on what we're trying to do in multiple ways. Um, at the end of the student feedback section, I will note that there was a little bit of negativity. I like to call it constructive criticism, but it was very minimal compared to the po overwhelming positive response. Um, one student said that Instagram felt less academic, and they meant it in a bad way. Um, I can only assume that this student meant they would have taken the assignment more seriously or would have felt more serious had it been a, a different medium. They didn't expand um, too much on, on what that meant to them. But um, I think that this kind of bleeds down from some of us, I think, have anxieties, and certainly some of our students' parents, have anxieties about some of the things that we're doing in class that feel more dare I say like kids, <laughs> that it feels less academic and that that feels dangerous. Um, one of the students did comment on that, so I think that's just reflecting a larger concern for a lot of people. Um, one student said that maintaining two Instagram accounts, that personal account and that professional account was a pain in the butt on their phone, switching in and out of that. I don't know. Um, and three students, and this is something that I'm thinking about as I'm moving forward, revising the assignment and planning to do it again, because I am going to do it again. Um, three students, which again is a big minority in this big majority group, said that the uh, assignment did not help them connect with others, that they merely posted, that they never looked at other people's responses. Um, and I don't know if that's a problem or if that's just some students are never going to do it. Some students are never going to get into it. I don't know whether to take that and really pay attention to it or just say, you cast a wide net, you hope to catch most. I, I don't know. Um, maybe you guys can help me with that. <laughs> the uh, final section of the handout that I gave you is um, how I want to move forward with some ideas um, and maybe some things that you might consider um, helping me think through or if you plan on doing something like this on your own that you might think through. Uh, once a week is a lot. There were only 16 kids in the class, and by the end of the semester, I was struggling to keep up with everybody's posts, what everybody was saying, giving them feedback, uh, even just quick feedback, like liking their picture and putting a quick comment. You know, it's a lot. Uh, so I'm considering doing posting once per novel rather than once per week. I don't know. Um, I'm also considering allowing students to use their personal Instagram account. Probably not, because I don't want to know. And then um, I'm also working on how to integrate integrate their posts into class time even more because there are things I want to cover and sometimes I forget about it and it doesn't drive the class as powerfully as it could. So I want to keep myself focused on letting them do this, letting them build this and letting them this not be a token but something that's really important to the course curriculum. Um, and one of the ways that I'm thinking about doing that is by having the final text of the course be our Instagram account. Um, one of the main things I want to find a way to improve is the interaction with um, students' posts, them interacting with each other. 
Though their survey responses suggest that they did appreciate each other's points of view, I could not get them to take the time to comment on each other's posts like you would in a discussion board setting. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't even know if that's important. Like, I don't want to micromanage it. I don't want to take the power away from them and like make them re not only post but reply, and I don't keep up with that either. Um, I feel like that would backtrack on some of the progress we've made toward creating a student-authored, student-developed course component. So what I'm thinking of doing instead of requiring that kind of ongoing discussion throughout the semester is instead having the last class, uh, excuse me, um, having the, the final text of the semester rather than putting in one more novel. Because you know, in those course evaluations, it always says something like, we read too much <laughs> in a literature class. Um, so instead of having one more novel, I'm thinking about um, how do we read this collectively student-authored text on the dream, on the nightmare, on these novels, on their connection to their own lives. Perhaps this could turn into a, a group paper, a group presentation at the end of the semester where groups choose eight to ten images from the whole collection and interpret it in some way. What does this tell us? What does this show us? What do we take from this? So that's where I am. That's what I did. That's how I'm thinking about moving forward. And if we have time, I would certainly welcome your feedback. Thank you for your time.